Hey, and welcome everybody. We are so thrilled to have our alumni weekend symposium tradition kicking off, even though virtually. Um, we will have a virtual happy hour today, but tomorrow we have on-campus events and we are extremely thrilled to actually be doing this um, for all of you guys and to be highlighting this amazing work from our alumni. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our Dean, Nancy Coleman. Um, thank you so much, Nancy, for everything you have done so far for our school. Uh, as your Vice President of the Board, I am very, very thrilled to be able to support you and uh, our entire board is actually doing so many things uh, to increase our community uh, feeling across the United States and the world. And um, your support has been um, extremely valuable. So I want to personally thank you for that. Nancy, um, for everybody, um, just a very short introduction. She is um, our new dean even though she is not new anymore um, and it is extremely um, important for me to introduce her because she is our first uh, female dean um, nancy is the dean of the harvard division of continuing education and university extension nancy is a senior pco that is professional continuing and online education leader. Uh, she's deeply committed to technology and innovation, which touches my heart personally, uh, because that is what I do after Harvard. And she has been instrumental in creating education and access opportunities for learners of all ages, types, and all type of socioeconomic backgrounds. Nancy brings an incredibly diverse expertise to her leadership of the division, having previously served in roles in both small and large institutions, corporate and startup ventures, as well as she has taught both online and in the classroom. Before joining Harvard, Nancy created well, Wellesley uh, Extended, a unit of Wellesley College encompassing summer term, professional and education. In 2017, she founded the Contemporary Women's Leadership Institute, a global program for undergraduate women. Nancy also serves as the Director of Distance Education at Boston University and as VP of Academy Services at KeyPath, an online program management firm that oversees all instructional design and student service operations for the organization's global offices. Nancy is currently on the board of UPCA, University Professional and Continuing Education Association, and she also served as their president for 2020 and 2021. She holds an ED doctorate in human and organizational learning from George Washington University, where her dissertation explored leadership behaviors in online learning units. She also holds a, an MBA from Boston University Questrom School of Management and a Bachelor in Science in Marketing from Stonehill University. Nancy, it's our pleasure to have you. Thank you, Sol. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's so nice to, to see you all virtually this morning on the kickoff of our Saturday Virtual Alumni Symposium. I'm really thrilled to be with you. And I guess I question, at what point are you no longer new at Harvard? Because I feel new, but yet I don't feel new. So I'm kind of in this weird transition phase between new and not so new. Um, I will say that this is this is my pleasure to, to have it be the second annual Saturday Symposium that I've had the opportunity to kick off. Um, so I guess that's, that's good for something. And I'm really thrilled to be participating this week in our first on-campus commencement activities since 2019 and my first on-campus commencement activities 
I'm so excited. You'll see my virtual background that I've had up for days. Um, this is going to look very familiar to all of you because it's Tercentenary Theater <clears throat> where you all graduated and it'll be my first time really experiencing the amazingness that's that. So let me just say, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but um, it's really just my, my pleasure to be with you today and to get to know more and more of our alumni community. You are all such a special group of people who have done so much for the school and have really committed to learning in adulthood, which we know is a really difficult task. And your achievements are so important because they're really held up as exemplars for our current students who, as you know, you know, there's good times and there's bad times as you're pursuing your degree, right? It gets hard sometimes. And when it does, being able to look back on this incredible community of support that you as the alumni provide to our students is so important and we are so grateful for that. We have been, um, you know, I've been lucky this year because we've started to do some in-person alumni events and some virtual events. So over the past year, I am really thrilled that I've gotten to speak to some of you in more depth about your experience, just to learn about you know, what, what made it special, right? What, what was being an extension school student all about and how can we continue to build on that specialness and make it even better. So um, my team and I are really hard at work about thinking about different things that we can do to not only enhance the current student experience, but also to give you reasons to come back and see us, to be a bigger part of our community. And some of those things that we're doing include launching new certificates and, degree and degrees where we're, we've launched this year a cybersecurity program, a health and society program. We're looking at a physician assistant program as part of our pre-medical program. And really the common theme between all of those is how do we bring together practitioner, like actually professional content and marry that with the liberal arts, which you all know is, is our sweet spot. So we're gonna to continue to do that in a big way. We think it's really important. It's core of who we are as Harvard and as the Harvard Extension School. But in addition to that, we really want to hear from you. Tell us what you would like to see us do. And I know I'm just going to say all the time I get asked, the number one question I get asked by alums is, when are you going to launch a doctoral program? And the answer to that is not quite yet. You know, we'll, we'll see if that is on the roadmap in the future. Um, but we're really looking at shorter forms of content as well um, to bridge the gap between two and three day professional development programs that we have and the longer term certificate and degree programs at the extension school. So as, as Sol said, I would consider myself an educational entrepreneur and we're really looking at how can we take the amazing things that we have at the extension school and at the division of continuing education and create even more amazing programs and services for our current students, but certainly our alumni community. Um, so I'm just gonna pause there and say that um, I know that I'm the one who's standing between you and this amazing lineup of alumni presenters that we have today. As I looked at the, as I looked at the agenda for today, I'm really thrilled with, with these four with these four presenters because they really are choosing to speak on issues that I believe are at the core of our society and so important and have such impact. So I think the more that we can learn, the more that we can learn, learn from our alumni who have gone out into the world and are taking what they learned here at the Extension School and using that for good, that just warms my heart. It just makes me feel good in so many ways. So with that, I will say good morning. It's lovely to see you. Enjoy the day. And um, please share our, your feedback with us if there's anything that we could do to support you in your quest for personal and professional development. Please let us know. So thank you, Jill. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. I just want to chime in uh, just to quickly say I am equally just as thrilled for these presenters and so grateful to have Nancy's leadership here at the division to take us into a new future with unimagined opportunity and to have Soul working so darn hard on the board of directors to work with us to make that future absolutely brilliant. So thank you all for, for attending and to our amazing presenters who we're going to buckle up and listen to now. So with that, Sol, let's let's do this.
Fantastic. And as both of you have said, yes, I am also extremely, extremely thrilled not to just have the presenters, but for the amazing topics that they're going to be talking about. Um, many of you know, but I am the CEO of an ecosystem of uh, digital transformation companies that actually I formed in my la latter years at Harvard. And my life has changed tremendously after Harvard as well. And we are doing many things for um, not just globally, but also for hopefully for a school. And um, this first presenter actually talks about a specific area in, um, in crisis. And that is something that I think all of us should have as part Part of our ethical business practices, see the global picture. So let me just introduce to you our first presenter of the day, Daniel Farber Huang. He is ALM 20 um, of 2020 and Teresa Mendes, Menders. Uh, they will be speaking on the power of faces looking at the global refugee crisis, which cannot be more poignant right now. Um, Daniel is also entrepreneur in residence in clean slate security, as well as currently holds the CEO position at EcoString Group. And he's part of the board of directors of um, ECRI, as well as entrepreneurial advisor for the Keller Center for Innovation. He also is the founder and team leader and government liaison for Wang Menders Photography as well in Princeton, New Jersey. Daniel, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It's a, both a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, we are very excited to be able to share information on the power of faces. But bear with us. Um, my host is my host screen um, is disabled right now for sharing. If somebody could please give us permission, we would uh, love to jump into our our images. You guys should be all set if you want to give it a try. Ah, uh, yes, you are correct. Okay, fantastic. Great. <clears throat> Let's go. Okay, can everybody? I assume everybody can see. Uh, <clears throat> can see that. Um, let's face it. Our beautiful, precious, non-refundable world is a mess today. It's full of conflict, strife, poverty, hunger, and anger. But it's also full and abundant in love, kindness, compassion, generosity, and hope. We've all heard about the global refugee crisis. Very likely, some of you may know it personally. We hear the generic statistics that 84 million people have been forced to flee their homes due to conflict or persecution. 84 million people. We have a very hard time comprehending what a massive scale of humanity, humanity that even means. And if we can't comprehend it, how can we work to solve it? For us, we start one face at a time. What image comes to mind when you hear the word refugee? Our goal through our work is to remind the broader public that refugees aren't merely a number or statistic, but instead individuals who, just like you and us, are seeking a better life in a kinder world. <clears throat> and just like each of us, each of these individuals matter. This photo was taken during the winter in 2017 at the Suda refugee camp in Chios, Greece. Here, several men from Syria, Iraq, and other countries huddle in the tunnels of an ancient fort, seeking warmth from the bitterly cold ocean outside. For the last several years, We've been working to raise awareness of the plight of displaced people around the world, having documented refugee crises across Greece, as well as in Turkey, Mexico, Bangladesh, and very recently at the Poland-Ukraine border. This video was filmed in January 2017 at the Suda refugee camp, when Greece experienced an extremely cold winter. Hundreds of people were living in thin plastic tents. Thank you. 
The man on the right is Youssef, who fled the war in Syria. He had been living in the Suda camp for months when we met him. During his time there, the Suda camp had been attacked and firebombed by nationalists on multiple occasions. Youssef has given us his permission to share the next video that he took of one of the attacks. كم كيوس في جزيرة كيوس السوداء مظاهرات حرق الكم Attackers threw stones and boulders from the cliffs above the camp at the refugees in the tents below and burned several tents and storage facilities. After often risking their lives to reach safe haven, refugees discover the hard truth that they're still not safe, even when they're under the protection of local and world authorities. We've documented the situation in Chios over time and have seen that unfold. In 2016, Greek Islanders were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for their incredible humanitarian response to the global refugee crisis. We were there twice in 2017 and a third time in 2018 when we went on night patrol with the Hellenic Coast Guard as they searched the Aegean Sea to assist refugees making the dangerous ocean crossing. We witnessed the Coast Guard at work. In this photo, the Coast Guard had intercepted a refugee boat on the water, transferred the passengers to their vessel, and were bringing them into port safely. The woman in this photo was pregnant. She went into labor within an hour of arriving. If the Coast Guard didn't help them, she likely would have gone into labor on the ocean in their overcrowded, inflatable raft. They were the heroes that day. When millions of people are forced to flee their homelands, there is no quick or easy way to fix that, solution, that situation. At the outset of a crisis, there is often a certain amount of immediate compassion and support, but unfortunately, with enough time and pressure, much of that initial goodwill can fade. With enough time and pressure, kindness can turn into cruelty. Charity can turn to ruthlessness. Thousands upon thousands of refugees have landed on Greece's shores over the years, overwhelming much of the country and its resources. Over the years, Greece's attitude toward refugees have changed. This video was published online in early 2020 showing a Greek Coast Guard vessel blocking an overloaded inflatable refugee boat from crossing into Greek waters instead of trying to help it. You can see a person firing warning sh shots in the front of the inflatable boat and then another person hitting and pushing away the refugees with a gaff stick. This change of attitude is not isolated to Greece. We want to do everything within our power to not let that happen by never losing sight that refugees are individuals, they're seeking a better life, in a kinder world than the one that they are fleeing. In 2018, we went to Tijuana, Mexico, because we were hearing about a growing humanitarian crisis at the border. But there were so many different opinions about what was going on that we wanted to learn about it directly. The so-called migrant caravan was comprised of tens of thousands of people fleeing violence, primarily from Honduras and other Central American countries. This location was the Baratel refugee camp in Tijuana, which was previously a dance hall and turned into a makeshift camp. Thousands of people were relocated from the Mexico-US border and were now being housed in inhumane conditions. At Barato, there was a growing risk of typhoid, tuberculosis, and even cholera threatening the people. The inflammatory propaganda we were hearing reminded us of false accusations made against other groups in the past. The men, women, and children at the border were being demonized and that made us angry. What's the point of us studying history if we're not going to learn from it? There is so much argument and so little progress about this issue. We know that people do not leave their homes willingly. We must not forget that. 
Sometimes people may incorrectly assume that others who are living in a bad or dirty situation are bad or dirty people, but that is simply not the case. The vulnerable people detained here were under constant threat. The camp was located in an area plagued by severe local crime. Women and children and girls are at risk to countless dangers when fleeing their homeland, as well as detained in a new camp or country. The problems the world is facing can seem overwhelming at times, and very often they are, but we try to remember that helping even one person can make a difference. In 2019, we were in Bangladesh learning about the Rohingya refugee crisis firsthand in the Palukali Kutupalong refugee camp, which is the largest refugee camp in the world with up to 1.1 million people uh, spanning generations. Men, women, and children have been fleeing Myanmar for decades, finding safety in Bangladesh. 2017 marked the most recent crisis with the Myanmar government perpetuating what the United Nations calls a genocide. In the camps, we spoke with a young man named Ramzan. Two years earlier, Ramzan and his family of eight walked three days and three nights from his village to reach a safe area in Bangladesh. Ramzan said he remembers the bodies floating in the river as he fled Myanmar. He remembers the houses being burned down by the army. He remembers the adults and the children that were locked inside as the soldiers ignited the fuel. He remembers everything. He told us, I am totally disappointed with my life. This camp region used to be lush forest where elephants roamed. Today, it's as dry as a desert. The trees long clear to make way for housing or burned as firewood. Make no mistake, the living conditions for, ind for these individuals are horrible. All refugees face countless risks every single day. Human trafficking, sex trafficking, crime, poverty, lack of medical care, lack of education, being prevented from earning a living and waiting for years in limbo with no ability to establish a new life <clears throat> are just some of the injustices that refugees face. We are not so naive to think that our world will be completely free of conflict, but we seek to shine a light on the innocent and oppressed so that they are not ignored, forgotten, or erased. We do the work that we do because we have been given a gift. And it's the same gift that every person here with us today has been given. We all have the gift of a voice that we can use on behalf of those who have had their voices taken away. We use our resources, energy, and time to raise awareness of the global refugee crisis because we don't want anyone to use the excuse I didn't know as a reason not to take a stand against injustice. In the weeks and days prior to Russia invading Ukraine, we were seeing actions and events compounding, which were all moving closer to the likelihood of war and the humanitarian crises that unfortunately always arise. We know that raising awareness of humanitarian crises can spur action. The faster we can document the situation and share objective information with the public, the faster at-risk people can be helped. We were at the Poland-Ukraine border in mid-March this year, shortly after Russian troops invaded the Ukraine. In this photo, a mother carries an infant across the Polish border at Medica. Ukrainians crossing the border exhibited a wide range of emotions, from tears and sadness to relief and sometimes laughter, as everyone's personal situation was unique. Many people appear to be tired, weary, even exhausted from their journeys. The waiting time at this Polish border checkpoint could take up to four hours for people to be processed. This photo was taken at the Chemsmej train station, about 13 miles west of the Poland-Ukraine border. <clears throat> for many people, this was their first stop in Poland after traveling from their cities and towns in the Ukraine. The vast majority of, ref of Ukrainian refugees are women, children, and the elderly, as Ukrainian men between the ages of 18 to 60 are prohibited from leaving the country until martial law has been lifted. There's a saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men and women do nothing. Do we open our arms or turn our backs on the most vulnerable people? The question we pose to you is, will you step up now when our world needs you most?
When we started reporting on the refugee crisis and spending time with people in camps, we realized that most everybody had lost their treasured family photos when they fled their homelands. We believe having a printed photo of family or friends is a special thing to hold in your hand and can be a great comfort in times of need. Now we bring several portable photo printers and simple colorful backdrops when we travel. Our intention is simple. We intentionally crop out the context of the refugee camp to focus on the individual, not their label as merely refugee. The individuals you see in these portraits have given us permission to share and publish their images to help raise awareness. To date, we have given out thousands of printed photos to displaced people to keep and are continuing to do so. We show people with their inherent courage, beauty, dignity, and grace. Our particular tools are our cameras and our skills are very simple. One skill is our willingness to make eye contact with strangers, smile, and start a conversation. Our other main skill is our willingness to speak up and raise awareness on causes important to us. We also believe that if somewhere, if someone were able to look into the stranger's eyes, they would be less likely to fear that stranger. Our teenage children have been actively involved in the power of faces as well. They are able to speak from the perspectives of young people and raise awareness of the refugee crisis with a wide range of audiences. Here is a photo of them working with us in Tijuana, and you can see some of our high volume portable printer setup we built on the right of the image. Our aim is to show that everyday people like you and us can in fact take our compassion and turn it into action to help the most vulnerable people today. We're not trying to say projects like this are that simple to do, but they actually can be if you choose to make it so. As we've done our work, a lot of people have said to us, well, it's easy for us to stand up here and talk about all this idealistic stuff because we get paid to go around in the world taking photos. But when we tell them we do not get paid to do this and we both have full-time day jobs, Teresa is a chief of staff at a pharmaceutical company and I'm a privacy and strategy consultant. They, they realize um, our documentary work is done whenever and wherever we can fit it in between our jobs our four children, which is a whole other story, and the demands of our daily life. We plan our time accordingly because this is important to us. What we've learned from our experiences is that focusing on helping people does not take away from other parts of our lives. It truly does open up so much more, and not just on an emotional or spiritual level, but on the way we prioritize and spend our waking minutes. There are many moments of joy and happiness in our interactions with the people in these photos, but there's also the reality of the challenges and hardships that people, that refugees are facing every single day. We intentionally leave the images realistic and untouched to show, to show the true faces of the people we meet. We believe it would be a disservice to sugarcoat or dilute the on the ground situation. We met this Rohingya family at the Balakali Kuchibalong refugee camp in Bangladesh. The four-year-old girl here was blinded when she was hit in the face with shrapnel as her family was running from soldiers shooting at them. Her father said she also has blood cancer but has no money to pay for her treatment and the organizations that he reached out to say they have no money or resources to help his case. If you want to help refugees now, donate money resources, or your time to groups active in any location where there is need. If you want to help on the longer term solutions, support groups like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch who try to change policy. You can find your legislators who are sympathetic to refugees and basic human rights and support them. Equally importantly, reach out to your legislators who are fighting against refugees and let them know that you want your country to do its fair share in addressing this crisis. Tell them diversity makes us stronger, not weaker. Tell them that you are not afraid. Every person in these portraits has their own story to tell. Every person has suffered their own immeasurable pain and loss. We know we cannot encapsulate their plights into a single photograph. What we can do, however, is add constructively to the broader conversation about refugees 
and encourage the public to engage in informed discussion on how to address the crisis. We don't think we are naively optimistic on the future, but perhaps we should all start being just a little more. We truly believe that collectively, everyday people engaging to fix the hard parts of our world can drive the change we need. We believe that when enough ordinary people like you and us use our words and actions to shout, this has gone on for too long, this must stop, then policymakers and politicians will have to take notice and respond. Clearly, we have a long way to go, but never give up. Hope does not die here. The question we pose to you again is, will you step up now when our world needs you most? Thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Daniel and Teresa. And you are 100% correct. Um, we can all do something, um, even in a small um in a small level, for example, um, what we are doing at Data Innovation Labs, I actually now have an advisor who is a Harvard mate. She is a graduate a certificate uh, from our school, and uh, she works on a crisis, on emergency response crisis, as well as a legal uh, practice. And we are actually... Um, opening a store in which all the you know the 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 purchases from you know t-shirts and things like that are going to go to a specific um charity that actually does emergency response and is doing a lot of emergency response in the Ukraine as well as here in the United States for uh, uh, sex rings and slavery and they are actually former FBI as well as military special forces that do special extractions. And we have been able to contribute for special extractions in the Ukraine. A little bit goes a long way, but <laughs> you're right. That goes a long way, good for you and your That's team. Right. You know what, Dan yes. is Daniel and Teresa, I just have to say, like, what really strikes me is that, you know, from your bios and just how busy your life is, that you can make time for this and, you know, and, and give back in this way and do everything that you can. I mean, that's really just incredibly um, moving to me, just, you know, sort of knowing who you are and what your background is and all that you're doing on, the, on in life. I mean, I think you've captured, you know, such an emotion and, and meaning, and I, I, I can't imagine how you can do this emotionally. Like, how do you hold up in that? I mean, it's heartbreaking. We, well, we have each other. I think um, in the beginning it was difficult, but what we try to do is we, we don't keep anything inside. We talk about it, we debrief. I mean, this is, this is a message for all volunteers that are working in situations like this. You have to take time for yourself, um, take time for your own self-care, mentally, emotionally, physically. So we do that, we make that a priority. And as we started bringing our children with us, it became more important because it's very important to um, make sure that you're able to continue to do the work you're doing. So we do take the time and the trips are hard on us. The trip to the Ukraine was very difficult. It was very difficult, but you know, we, we take the time before we leave you know, to, de you know, to decompress, um, spend some time, a little bit of enjoyment, and then we, we talk about it. You have to talk about it and keep your you know, just just keep your your yourself um, in mind because you can't be helpful to others if you're not doing that. So that's so well said. And I did drop a link in chat to a Harvard Gazette coverage of uh, their work in the Ukraine. So please take a look at that. And I think you know, in that moment, I know Sol can um, can also chime in, but everybody at Harvard was looking for ways to help and looking for ways to have an impact. And it's really difficult to do and to understand how to do it in the right way. What are the right organizations to support? So, you know, in, in your advocacy for directing help, directing donation, I really appreciate that. Because again, it's, you know, we feel helpless at times with being able to jump in and stop something so horrendous. Um, so really, again, thank you. And for sharing your story with the Gazette, that allows the rest of the Harvard community to understand your, uh, your, what you're seeing, what you're viewing, make sense of it all, but also to help enact solutions. So thank you for, for sharing that with Harvard, because it's a very large 
you know, five to 600,000 people who immediately see it, plus all of the other friends of the university. Absolutely. You're 100% correct, Jill. Um, And, you know, at the board, uh, in our alumni board, we have we actually have an initiative for Ukraine emergency response. But uh, a couple of things, uh, we do have a question for you on chat, Um, but before, because we're gonna be tight with time before that, I really think that this symposium, as different as other years because of the topics that we're talking about, um, it really is an opportunity for all of us to connect. So Daniel and Teresa, please connect with me and, and the board, and we will also spread your word. Connect on LinkedIn. Um, th- all the topics that our panelists are going to be talking about are very, very poignant and is different than other years where we have actually shown the amazing work that everybody's doing. But this year is truly about connection. And on that note, um, the question is, um, are you able to bring mini solutions to new camps that you learned in other ones? And this is from Dan Bergman. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, just even thinking about the last few weeks, the reason why we were able to be on the ground uh, at the Poland Ukraine border so quickly after uh, hostility started was uh, because of the experience that we had. Um, built up over the past several years, being in um, very uh, fluid, very, um, you know, very fluid humanitarian crises around the world. Um, In an ideal situation, we would have months of pre-planning to do, being able to connect with government agencies on the ground in whatever country we're going to, identify who we really want to meet, whether it's agencies or individuals. Um, This this time, it was much more fluid, as you can imagine, where um, everybody, every agency, every government entity was all trying to figure it out as it was unfolding. Uh, And one of the things that we've worked really hard to try to um, uh, formalize in, at least in our mental approach to things, is how can we work most effectively in situations like that to uh, be able to create the, the greatest value of, of reportage, um, you know, to be able to share with the public afterwards. And so, yeah, absolutely. Every, every situation is different. Um, you know, I think of the one common thing, the one common thing that we experience in all of our travels is the individuals, the men, women, children, elderly who we connect with are, you know, fundamentally just um, the one thing that they all have in common, like we said before, is they are individuals who are looking for a better life in a kinder world. And this is wonderful. I'm so glad that you're able to do that. So Dan Bergman, yes, they are actually really engaged in applying this mini solutions. And please connect because in regards to psychological help, um, mm-hmm. actually there's many members of our community that and, and, and members in chair positions in chapters that actually are in that space. And also please connect with me because at DIL, we also have a specific area for psychological help in with AI for emergency response. So thank you so much, Daniel and Mm -hmm. Teresa. And now we move on to Natalie Watchman Perillo. Um, She is going to be talking about a very important topic for all of us. And um, I cannot wait to hear this presentation as well as um, I can't wait to connect with her as well. She, her topic is on compassion fatigue, addressing the precursors to burnout. And um, she has a tremendous background uh, and she holds an organizational behavioral, behavior graduate certificate. Thank you so much, Natalie, and uh, please share with us. Thank you. Um, Thank you all for having me today. I'm just going to pull up my slides. Okay. 
again, thank you for having me here today. And um, Daniel and Teresa, what an incredible um, presentation, very moving. Um, and you offer really great tangible strategies that we all can um, use and implement to, to help the, the world. Um, I think that my topic is um, very appropriate to follow up on, um, on your presentation because um, burnout and compassion fatigue is something that many of us can relate to. Um, and full disclosure, this is an area that I'm researching um, and that I have been researching over the past few years um, and I'm currently pursuing as a side project. So um, I'm actually a PhD candidate at the Chicago School and um, am looking at the various uh, variables that are impacting um, burnout. So at this point, I have more questions than answers. Um, and I look forward to your questions and input at the end. Um, I'm hoping that today my presentation can challenge the science community to uh, think about solutions that are effective and evidence-based that can be accessible to all people. So just a little bit about me, that's right. I um, graduated in 2017 from the Organizational Behavior um, Graduate Certificate Program. I am currently a PhD candidate. I'm also adjunct faculty at Simmons University, and some of my research interests include performance feedback, burnout, and compassion fatigue. So I initially started to look into the topic of burnout pre-pandemic life while working six days a week to pay off student loan debt in a workplace that failed to cultivate an environment for compassion and growth for their employees. After living through the pandemic these past two years, and we're still dealing with the effects of the, the pandemic, the topic of burnout has become increasingly more relevant um, to us all as a, a shared experience. Much of the research before the pandemic focused on occupation-specific uh, exhaustion. Um, focusing on those human service occupations, education fields, and healthcare careers, where uh, these uh, careers um, provide um, a lot of support and response in order to care for people who are facing um, challenges and, and significant barriers. So, Fast forward to today, the pandemic has negatively affected many people, and we are starting to come into contact with more research about what has happened over the past two years. Um, there has been a lot of uncertainty that people have faced, isolation, lockdown variables. In fact, in the Harvard Bus Business Review recently, there was discussion about millions of people losing jobs, facing financial and food insecurities, and putting people's lives at everyday risk when just dealing with the um, impact of, of COVID and, and, and disease and illness. So we're, we're talking about acute stress that becomes chronic stress. So as I mentioned before, the previous research and data really focuses on these educational fields, these healthcare careers. And as you can see, burnout is not a new topic. We have seen this occur quite a bit in our society when discussing teachers and, and them leaving the, the education field within the first five years of being a, a teacher. Nurse 31.5% uh, nurses left from burnout in 2018, it would be interesting to see what those numbers look like today after having put so much stress and pressure on our healthcare systems during the pandemic. Veterinarians are 2.7 times more likely to commit suicide due to the demands and the challenges they face in having to deal with emergency type of situations on an ongoing daily basis. And then AMA actually reported a 42% physician burnout 
And again, it would be interesting to see how these numbers um, continue to pan out over time. So what is the impact of burnout? As we've been discussing, um, the impact of burnout can um, cause chronic stress, mental health issues, including anxiety, depression, irritability, and the personal impact, feeling isolated, a failure to complete tasks, potentially increase in substance abuse. There's also a professional impact that occurs when you are trying to recover from burnout. There's a lack of work engagement, job dissatisfaction, performance issues. This often leads to being fired or potentially quitting the career altogether. And then there's the impact of the physical health issues. There's been a, a report of increasing health disease and high blood pressure that's affected many of our, our individuals in our society. So what is burnout? Before we talk about compassion fatigue, we need to understand really what burnout is. Burnout is um, slow, it's a slow onset of these symptoms and behaviors that leads to a very long, intensive, involved recovery. It's a cumulative process that's marked by emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion. It's a withdrawal from your community and society. Um, burnout is what we get when compassion fatigue occurs and is not addressed. So if compassion fatigue occurs before burnout, then compa is compassion fatigue a precursor? Can we label it as such? Before we discuss that, we need to really operationally define what is a precursor? How are we looking at precursors to burnout? And the dictionary, if you just look up what uh, precursor is, offers a, a very general uh, definition, one that goes before or announces the coming of another. Behavior analytic literature uh, defines precursor behavior as any response that tends to occur immediately before or prior to severe significant problem behavior. So I um, have recently become a new mother um, and I tend to use my children as examples when talking about real life situations because um, what better way to understand humanity and human behavior than to take a look at human development at its basic level. Um, so the weather has become increasingly nicer. Um, I'm in the New York City area, actually, and um, I've recently introduced my daughter to grass. Uh, initially, when I put her down in the grass, she would wince, rock, close her hands, um, show signs of um, distress, and um, make a few noises. Now, if I did not help her or support her immediately when I saw these um, minimal signs and minimal behaviors, she would escalate then to crying, screaming, throwing her body backwards, and being in much more distress than she was initially, which then takes her a little bit longer to calm down and to regroup. So what I'm asking our science community is, if we know that burnout involves a long intensive recovery, then we need to study and focus on these precursors that we can observe um, over time. And our goal, uh, behavioral science strategies, our goal should be targeting these precursors in order to reduce the risk that's associated with a long-term recovery. If we can identify these precursors earlier on that are functionally equivalent to these more severe um, symptoms, then we could potentially turn our ships around. So much of the um, research on studying precursors 
and precursor behavior involves precursor analyses to identify these environmental variables. What is going on in this individual's life? We need to look at their daily patterns, the types of supports they're coming into contact, and how they're able to access different resources and supports. A lot of the literature also focuses on analyzing these contingencies, so looking at the environment for precursor behaviors that offer a pattern that cause burnout. So now it's time to talk about compassion fatigue. If we are able to identify compassion fatigue as a potential precursor to burnout, let's fully understand what compassion fatigue is. In Previous literature, um, Figley 1995, focused on compassion fatigue as it relates to therapists having to take on the challenges they face with their clients. Um, however, I believe that this is very applicable to anyone who um, devotes themselves to caring for others who may face challenges. This can be as something as simple as just being a parent. Um, and so with compassion fatigue, we're really looking at a rapid onset of these symptoms, more rapid than burnout, but with a quicker, faster recovery. Some of those symptoms or precursors to burnout can be identified as exhaustion, anger and irritability, increased use of alcohol and drugs, hypersensitivity, problems with intimacy and personal relationships, a diminished sense of enjoyment of career, dread of working, an increase of absenteeism, missing work, taking many sick days, and the basic impaired ability to make decisions. So what do we do and what don't we know? We know that environmental variables contribute to these onset of symptoms? What reoccurring variables are we contacting daily that are contributing to the increased response effort and the little reward or rest that we are coming into contact with? Research is starting to identify these key factors involved at multiple levels of our society that contribute to a context in which individuals are able to access these resources. So for example, um, much of the recent literature is coming out with solutions, but how accessible are these solutions um, to all individuals? A single working mother with little community support is going to face more challenges in accessing support and resources than a working mother who has a partner and financial resources to childcare options. So I'm urging and pushing and challenging the science community to further explore how we can offer solutions to everyone. So Biglin and Skinner actually provide a theoretical points of view about how changing patterns of behavior can occur. So if we are proactive enough at multiple levels in our society, allowing individuals to contact more readily available resources that support them at these levels will offer more sustainable solutions. So our goal as a society, and this actually relates to Daniel and Teresa's uh, presentation in terms of what we can do as individuals to impact the greater society is that we need to have processes and resources that link individuals to their community that supported at the organizational level and then reinforced by government policies. So at the individual level, what we're, what we're talking about is being able to identify these symptoms and behaviors right away. What are you, what are some of your individual barriers that are preventing you from accessing respite or support? Is it a lack of resources or is it a lack of equitable access to these resources? At the community level, how can we at the community level increase this accessibility to uh, all individuals? 
right? We're talking about creating an inclusive environment where not only certain types of people can access mental health support, but that anyone who has differing means can access the support they need to. And as a community, how can we decrease these barriers to include everyone um, from, from various backgrounds? Organizations, we're asking at the organizational level for businesses to reevaluate their workplace policies. How are you providing paternity and maternity time to support your employees? Do you have a grieving policy where individuals can take time to take off to grieve and heal when experiencing loss? What ways as supervisors and mentors are we consistently checking in with, with employees and supporting them on a day-to-day -day basis? How at the organizational level are we cultivating a culture of caring? And then there is the government level. How can we change our policies in order to reinforce these new practices and habits? We have to be able to do this and advocate for these changes in order to shift cultural values and shift these new ways of individuals to get access to support. So how I'd like to visualize the idea of addressing these precursors is something that we all can identify with having various technological tools at our hand, whether you have a phone, a computer, an iPad, we're all familiar with this image of the battery, right? And when our battery is fully charged, we're able to use and access our, our tools and, and phones pretty readily, pretty readily. Now, when we're at empty, when our battery goes to empty, we have to then take additional time to plug in and recharge. So what I am suggesting in my research that I've been focusing on is seeing if there's a way that we can address the battery depletion here at the yellow or orange levels before we go on empty. How can we recharge and get our batteries back up uh, to, full, to full completion in a shorter amount of time without needing to have a long intensive process in order to recharge? So again, I just would like to wrap things up that we have a lot of questions and um, we really need to challenge our science community and those who are offering solutions to burnout and compassion fatigue and ask ourselves, are these solutions effective, evidence-based and even individualized? Are these solutions accessible to all? Are we suggesting um, accessing childcare without actually providing solutions and tools for everyone to be able to access childcare? Um, and do we have equitable access to these resources? So um, this is something that I'm currently working on um, as I've been um, in the process of researching and finding these, locating these variables, the different ways that we're gonna come up with um, sustainable solutions that are accessible to everyone. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving me the time and I look forward to your questions and, and comments and feedback. Natalie, this has been um, an amazing um, topic. And I do actually have, um, I have a couple questions for you, but uh, if you need um, any type of uh, observational subjects, I think that you are probably going to find a lot of them in this community. Um, I volunteer, and I'm sure other people will volunteer as well. Um, this is quite thrilling how you actually made that division in between um, the, the compassion fatigue precursor factor and how you establish 
um, your work in trying to, you know, before your battery runs out, plug it in, right? I mean, the same thing we do with our technology. So talking about technology, I have a specific question for you. Are you considering in your research, because you know how our, our brains are not designed to actually process LED screens, and they actually, if you are, ex they have sleep interruptions and interference, and you know how, um, there is some work and research being done in scholarship regarding the fact that um, depression can that that the use of LED screens on the phone too much as a, outside of the vision problems. I'm not sure if people are familiar, but there are uh, many visual uh, conditions, uh, including um, you know when you start getting older, needing to have uh, reading glasses that are actually. Uh, now increasing in time, uh, in, in when it happens to you because of the use of the phones. But outside of that, there's a lot of work in, in LED screens and their cognitive frontal lobes effect on depression. So are you interfacing the use? I, I know, I mean, there's so much you can interface, especially in your PhD, but um, are you interfacing that use of technology with this work or are you, you, are you putting it for future work? So right, right now what we're doing is we're um, sort of taking older models of assessing people in terms of, of burnout and expanding those to make them more applicable to to today's challenges. We hadn't considered um, uh, technology as a variable in terms of increasing depression. Um, we've been looking at, at um, demands, especially um, since many of our lives have been uprooted um, recently and our homes have become our workspaces have become childcare centers and, and schools, even during the pandemic, where many of us have had to juggle multiple jobs, um, which has increased what we are sort of taking on on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've been looking at um, the um, amount of, of work and expectations and work outputs that are being expected and required of individuals right now. Um, we hadn't considered the use of technology. However, I, I think that is a good variable um, to, to evaluate, especially since um, now we're all on screens, yeah. you know, and we spend so much of our time not interacting you know, one on one and physically with people as much as we did before the pandemic, that um, that loss of physical um, connection has been replaced by technology and these screens. I think that actually is a is a good point and is, is a good uh, parameter or variable to, to to further look into. There's a lot of work, especially with the depression. There's a lot of scholarship, and if you reach out, um, I can actually uh, at DIL. Um, I grounded the ecosystem of companies in digital transformation institutes, and one of them is research. So everything we do, we always test it on ourselves, but we have, for example, mental health and AI. We are actually um, coming up with this suite of uh, products called Supermind that actually enhances cognition, but we have had to take many, many steps and there's a lot of work. So if you connect with me, I can actually share some of that scholarship as well. Uh, and I'm sure great. that we do have, I know that we have a chair in the uh, Texas um, chapter and she actually is a psychologist and she's actually connecting with the research institutes as DIL as well. So, uh, but uh, we have many, many professionals, I think in our community that can assist, but on that topic that you talked about, and as you know, uh, when I previously um, introduced our amazing Dean. Um, Nancy, in 2017, she founded the Contemporary Women's Leadership Institute. And that, when you were talking immediately, of course, I thought of parenthood and, and the grieving portions. I mean, those, um, you know, were extremely relevant. But with the work that Nancy has done also, I, and as a woman, um, 
not trying to isolate the male component of our viewership right now or our community, but have you seen a gender divide in your study that there's a higher propensity uh, in, uh, in the female gender in your sample sizes versus the male gender? And also in within that female division, have you seen um, a difference um, in occurrence, right? In, in, in precursor occurrence as well, because you're concentrating on that you know, compassion fatigue portion. Uh, have you seen that happening more on uh, professional women that have to share the different roles of motherhood, um, you know, being a spouse, not having a spouse, or, um, or, or women that don't have that professional reality? Uh, definitely. Um, I'd say Right now, a lot of what we're seeing is that marginalized communities um, have been impacted by by this idea of compassion fatigue and burnout. So, um, you know, a black brown woman is going to have um, potentially more obstacles than you know a white a white woman. Um, but right right now, what we're looking at is you know. There are a lot of um, obstacles that um, many marginalized communities are facing right now, which does um, feed into the, the burden of having to um, have more responsibility and expectations. Um, LGBTQ communities have been greatly affected by burnout. Um, like I said, the black brown communities have been greatly impacted by the pandemic and, and um, you know, burnout. Um, certainly there has been a mass exodus of women in, you know, those who identify as women in the workplace who have been leaving their jobs because um, working at home is um, challenging when you are having to work, take care of the home, take care of your child and educate your child at home during lockdowns and isolations. It's created uh, a greater isolation and a greater issue in terms of having a separate space and boundaries um, where you can, you know, find time to just relax and, and rest and re recover um, because there's just no space for, for recovery. And I think that is, um, you know, something that we need to explore more in terms of you know, taking time How do off. you, yeah, respite yeah. and what, yeah. what is the right length of it, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, that was one of my questions, which we don't have time to right. ask. It. <laughs> and I'm sure that you all have so many more questions for Natalie. So I do encourage you to connect with her and to also reach out with your questions, which I know I will be doing. <laughs> and also I want to invite you, Natalie, to uh, at at in our in our board and actually with the support of our office of advancement and our dean we are actually uh going we have been working very hard and we will be launching soon a women's global network initiative and i think that your work will be so relevant to also be highlighted there but also to have you as part of of that committee so I'm inviting you, you to participate. Thank you so, so much. And should I respond to questions in the chat? Yes, Is please that appropriate? continue responding okay. in the chat okay. uh, while we move to our next presenter. Great. Terrific Thank you. work. Congratulations. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. And um, our next presenter. Um, all of these presenters have been very close to my heart. Um, I cannot express that. Um, you know, further, I think that I have reached the limits of words regarding that. Um, but Dan Bergman uh, is our next presenter, and his uh, topic is the end of intellectual disability lessons from non speaking autism. Daniel uh, actually is an ALB of 2021. And he graduated uh, from when our university with uh, cum laude um, ALB. And he actually was the first non-speaker with autism to do so. Uh, he won the oration competition. 
and to give the undergraduate commencement address via text-to-speech computer. He currently works off in some of the really puzzling uh, epistemological issues raised by his educational journey, and he was actually highlighted in Good Morning America for it. And Dan, I have to say, and um, there, there's so many faces of autism and the spectrum, and um, this is something that I'm sharing with our community too, because I'm sure that many of us are in this position. I am actually in the spectrum, but as different as you, I am extremely highly functional, and that caused me to be misdiagnosed for many, many years. I have embraced it like yourself in a way where I love my brain for what it is, and it makes me do all these different things that um, other people can't because I'm in the spectrum instead of thinking of it as a disability. So Dan, we cannot wait to hear your present, to, to see your presentation. Thank you. Autism has now become so prevalent that you likely know someone who doesn't look like they are paying attention and didn't learn to speak in a useful way. Today, thousands of children who don't look people in the eye and don't learn to speak are given up on and marinated in the lowest possible expectations, sending their parents and families into deep mourning and consigning them to thousands of hours of therapies that usually only help a little. But that is starting to change as more and more people realize that people like me, who live with non-speaking autism, are not actually intellectually disabled. It turns out that what looks like a permanent cognitive disability is really driven by severe motor apraxia. Here is Elizabeth Vosseler, a speech pathologist who has lived and worked through different ways of looking at autistic kids. She now runs IASC, an organization at the forefront of helping non-speakers with autism realize their full potential. Traditionally looking at it, we had a cognitive approach first, that there was an intellectual disability in people with autism. Then it sort of switched into, well, there's a behavioral component to it, and there's avoidance or lack of motivation or lack of caring to do well, so we have to appeal at a behavioral level. But it's not an issue of, I don't understand. It's not an issue of, I don't want to. It's an issue of, I can't make my body do it. She's right. I am sitting here like this for this shot because it takes me forever to make my body do anything. I can't even look into the camera and smile. But it turns out that with enough coaching and assistance, non-speakers like me can be taught to type, and with the ability to make language comes the ability to think abstractly and systematically, and with the ability to think comes the ability to participate in the world, especially if the world will be a little patient. And that's what I want to tell you about today. To give you an idea of what's involved, I want to share with you a video of the first moment I was taught to spell and think abstractly. I am 12 years old. I think of it as the best day of my life, but here's how it started. Not an auspicious beginning. Notice that I won't even sit down in the chair where I am expected. However, a remarkable teacher whom I have never met before, takes my resistance in stride and eventually the camera operator gives up and swings over to me. That's me, sitting on my mother's lap screaming my head off. Now look what happens. I am asked to answer a question. Let's look at it again more slowly. Soma did not rush to console me as anyone else in my world would have, but she also did not ignore my distress, she addressed it. And instead of telling me that I was okay she asked me a question about my experience. She didn't say what's the matter because answering that would have been beyond me. Remember, I couldn't speak. Instead, she made two plausible guesses about what was bothering me, that I was in a new place or that I didn't want to work and she gave me a choice. Very respectfully she said, it can be both, but which is more important? She assumed that I could make a judgment about which of two things was more important. No one, 
in all my history of special ed had asked me to compare two ideas. Then she put answering the question within my physical ability by going up to me and holding the two pieces of paper far enough apart so I had to make a real choice and could answer with a very crude flap of my hand, and notice that I stop crying when I am considering and answering the question. Now, taking the answer I chose, Soma proceeds to show me how to spell it. We are spelling, new place, and if you look very carefully you can see that by the time I get to the A, C, E, in, place, I am already scanning for the letters. C, and, place, easy as that. There is something else going on too. Soma and I are in a power struggle over whether or not I will sit down, she keeps trying and I keep refusing. So she uses that as the basis for the next question she is going to ask me. And then we spell standing. To make it easier to spell, Soma is using boards with letter holes so big that it takes three of them to hold the whole alphabet. Half an hour later, I am sitting in the chair, and Soma shows me a board with the whole alphabet on it. And look at my smile when I see it. The letter board with the smaller holes is harder to use, but I'm smiling because I get it now. All the words I have been hearing all my life are made up of these letters, and the words I have been hearing are the same things as the words I have seen printed, which are the same things as the words I can now make myself by sticking the pencil into the holes. Initially, she had me spell words which she had written and I had chosen, so we both knew what the letters were going to be. Making language myself was exciting enough without making up what the words were going to be. But 37 minutes into my first session with her we get a word I think of myself. Any word that comes to your mind when you are thinking about table. Okay, any word that comes, let me see. Think about it. Keep going. get it. H, good, it has to be a word. A, good, keep going, H, A. R, okay, there you are, at D, hard. Table is hard. H, A, R, D, hard. Look what went into those first few minutes. And 13 years later I got my ALB from the extension school. I am by no means the only non-speaker to do well in college. In 2012 Virginia Breen gave a TED Med talk at the Kennedy Center about the poetry that her then 14-year-old daughter Elizabeth Bonker had written after she learned to spell. You see, my 14-year-old daughter Elizabeth should be up here giving this talk, but she can't, because she can't speak. And last weekend, 10 years later, Elizabeth graduated at the top of her class at Rollins College and became the first non-speaker valedictorian having typed her address into a text-to-speech computer. God gave you a voice. Use it. So you can see that we are reachable and teachable and long to participate in and contribute to society. Unfortunately, whenever a non-speaker accomplishes something remarkable, people tend to say, oh you're one in a million. But Elizabeth and I are sure we are not. On the contrary, I am severely affected by autism, so if I can do it, the chances are that any non-speaker with autism can learn to think abstractly and communicate if we can figure out the tools they need, and put them within their ability to use them. Advocates and self-advocates for the non-speaking have started to ask the world to presume competence, by which they mean to expect us to understand rather than expecting us not to understand what's being said and what goes on in the world around us. It's very frustrating when people think we are not aware and not listening, but because of our apraxia which makes it hard for us to look like we are paying attention, such is the fate of most of us, either sometimes or all our lives. Elizabeth wrote a song that captures this feeling. I wish I had time to play you the whole song, but you can find it online. We are definitely in here, but it is important to be honest about the amount of help we need, and to make the most of the opportunities that offers. It is true that when I started spelling, I needed help to reach every letter. But is that all bad? Shared attention is the great goal of therapists who work with autistic kids. And you saw how hard Soma was working to keep track of which answers I chose and which words I typed. 
It's shared attention that pierces the loneliness of autism. The trick is to spell something really worth spelling and then the spelling can be the highlight of both people's day. The spellers I know all enjoy using unusual words that surprise their interlocutors. I was right to choose hard. Spelling is hard, so we spell things that are worth spelling. The problem isn't our cognition. We need help with many of what occupational therapists call activities of daily living. My neuromotor issues also prevent me from tying my shoes or buttoning a shirt without assistance. So if I need help dressing, why should writing be any different? Alas, though, the fact that our dependence doesn't stop when we write has led to a completely unnecessary obstacle. Because of the physical help we need, some entrenched experts preserve the fantasy of our intellectual disability by accusing our communication partners of authoring what we type. As Vikram Jaswal, a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia put it, A small, loud, and strangely influential group of individuals has dismissed the possibility that people who communicate with assistance from someone else are conveying their own thoughts. They insist that all users of these methods are actually being directed to point to particular letters by subtle cues that the assistant provides. This group of skeptics has made it impossible for non-speaking autistic people who communicate with assistants to get the support they need in schools. Some of these skeptics regularly ridicule and denigrate users of these methods and the people who support them. Juswal, by the way, is the lead author of an innovative study that used eye-tracking technology and statistical analysis to establish that autistic spellers are the authors of what we type even if we receive help. It is clear to me that we need research to study the relationship between the help we need and the piercing of the loneliness of autism. We can build robots to help us get dressed and maybe even help us write, but we need to do it without eliminating the increased human contact that is the true glory of my life since I learned to spell. Spelling for people like me is in its infancy, so of course it is arduous and controversial, but we will improve all that as we learn more about it. Meanwhile the paradigm shift is underway. For me, education is slow too, and that's been its great strength. Soma proved that I could answer questions and then showed my parents how to read to me. Read a sentence, ask a question about it, get me to spell the answer and then read the next sentence. As I answered the question, the full meaning of what I had heard made itself clear in my head. Astonishingly, it didn't matter how complex the material was, going slowly and thinking deeply were the keys to my comprehension. So just as it's important to spell things that are worth spelling, it's important to read things that stand up to close reading. That first summer, my father started reading me a Midsummer Night's Dream, couplet by couplet, and asked me questions about rhyme and meter, jealousy and metaphor, which I discovered I loved to answer. It took seven months to get to the end of the play, and I can hardly imagine a better way to use the time. The time flew by and I immediately asked for another Shakespeare play. By the time I got to Harvard, years of practice had made close reading my superpower. I hope you enjoyed my deep dive into those few minutes of video with Soma. To me what is interesting about that lesson only reveals itself when you go beat by beat. I think this points to the solution for how arduous this work of building a mind is, both for non-speakers and their families. Do something you love so much that reveling in all the details makes it that much more enjoyable. It becomes an unexpected way for families to share what they love most with their children with whom they haven't gotten to share very much. It's awful when someone thinks we need to have something simplified in order to understand it, when we just need to go slowly. I wonder if there is a lesson here for regular education as well. I could answer all those questions because I had been listening carefully for 12 years. Which raises the question of why my mind didn't develop fully until I learned to spell. I think it's the part about answering questions and making language that was missing. My mind needed to be exercised in order to develop. I'll end with a story about something my mind worked hard on before I learned to spell and therefore think systematically. I worked on this for hours and hours over years and years, because I sensed that it was fundamental. I grew up near the Metropolitan Museum and my caregivers often took me there, not for the art which I didn't understand, but for the beautiful, well-lit spaces and the cafeteria. Often, I would drag my caregivers towards the Chinese scholar's garden where there was a waterfall with live koi in the basin. 
I could find that room from anywhere in the museum and would pull my caregiver until they figured out what I wanted. Oh, you want to visit the fish pond? Successful communication always makes people happy. I could not roam the museum safely on my own, but I could use my gross motor muscles to pull my caregiver until they figured out what I wanted and could take over the task of getting us there. Once there, I would spend hours staring into the koi pond. Until I learned to spell, no one had any idea that I was working on something. A few years ago, to celebrate its 150th birthday, the museum made a series of videos about people who used the museum in unusual ways and I got to tell the story. I didn't even know that sounds and sights went together and represented the same event. I thought the world offered both things I could hear and things I could see, as separate phenomena. One day, when I was about nine years old, while I was looking, I suddenly realized that the sound of the waterfall was the same event as the sight of the water falling. Sound and sight went together, and there were only half as many things to understand in the world. I remember understanding people's footsteps as we walked out of the museum. I could begin to understand cars moving, and people coming into our apartment. The most important part was watching people talk to each other. For the first time I could put their expressions together with the words they made, and begin to understand the meanings of subtle facial expressions. To someone as completely overwhelmed as I was, this was a great relief and a fascinating discovery. Thank you for your shared attention. The truth is that my experience makes me wonder whether the whole idea of intellectual disability will someday be regarded as an outdated notion. And now, as you can imagine, I hope there are questions. What um, an amazing and touching presentation, Dan. And I know you are there. We have Dan and his father, Michael. Welcome. Um, I am very, very happy to have you. Uh, please continue to share questions. Um, I will relate them to Dan and Michael. Um, I have a question actually, um, you know, from being in the spectrum, I and if you have actually um, seen my speech at Sanders Theater, you uh, know that I am now hearing disabled is something that I was not born with. And it, it is because of my spectrum that I lost the ability and to hear and I have um, two other hearing disabilities and I can't is it, is this is it's similar to that a uh, cognitive associative thing that Daniel has experienced, right? That he realized that the sounds of the of the water was the same as the vision of the water. And I um, I can't hear my kids' voices. I cannot even hear my own voice um, as well. But have has have you Dan experienced other um, neurological cognitive um, issues uh, as part of you know this or has the ability to spell and Harvard which for me if you have seen my video is um, um, Harvard allowed me to regain my humanity I feel as a, as as a disabled person right um, but has that um, happened to Dan and what ha was the Harvard impact on our school impact for him? Dan is typing his answer into the chat. It will take a moment. Of course, of course. Um, and there is another question coming and actually, um, Thank you, M.E. Dillon, 
for asking this question because I was thinking about similar things uh, with the phobia tracking, you know, com computer. I'm not sure if in Dan's situation is uh, because of his because of his apraxia, it may be hard to do uh, the phobia tracking computing. But uh, later on, Dan, um, if you can answer if you have considered interacting with the ALS community as well. Um, and M.E. Dylan, I was actually thinking about the same thing. I, uh, I know that there are members of our community whose family members have or have had ALS. Um, so that is, is also a very relevant question. So just in case uh, people are not looking at the chat, Dan's answer is that he thinks that there is the physical disability and then our adaptation to it, which is often words. Harvard and before that pen really helped me, him change my adaptation. I cannot agree with you more. Uh, I had the same experience with Harvard as well. Um, it, it, it helped the, the amazing accessibility office allowed me to change my adaptation. Um, your, that is uh, such a very good way of putting it. And then we're waiting for Dan's answer for the next question. great uh, to be here today with us and thank you Dan um actually I wish we were in person for uh, the first time I would um really appreciate and give you a big hug um but there's also another question uh in the Q&A that is um from Bill and he asks about if you have close friends with whom you communicate. And if our time runs up, um, you know, Michael, feel free to answer there in the Q&A for Dan. Thank you, Saul. I have learned that I cannot answer for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, you're you're his conduit. I, that's that's what his I conduit, meant. Yes. yes, but I have no idea what he's going to say most of the time. Sometimes I'm absolutely sure and absolutely wrong, and that's important. That is a that's brilliant. Well, um, that goes for everybody, Dan. Right? Dan is no different, and um, you know. I don't think anyone can answer for anyone, um, but yes, you are his conduit. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, Dan will now answer about the close friends. Okay, terrific. 
Dan also says that he um, has not spent enough time with other disabilities as well. And um, yes, Jill, you are 100% correct. Uh, adaptation, um, what that specific word really touched me because I feel, as you know, Jill, uh, that's what Harvard helped me achieve. It achieved, it helped, and I think that's what also helped Dan to Harvard and Penn um, is that that adaptation is like the next step of evolution. And, um, you know, my disabilities happen because of the spectrum and their neurosensorial. And that portion of the um, adaptation is how you move, right? I mean, that is evolution 101. Most adaptable is actually you know, how we move forward in our species. Dan, terrific, thank you. Please go ahead and answer the question for Dan, um, Michael in the Q&A. And after that and crying, we will move on to the next speaker for today, Clarine Allen. And she talks about a very uh, poignant topic. Clarine, uh, thank you for being with us. She talks about race and education during COVID and defining the COVID gap years. Um, I, I am extremely thrilled to actually be um, hearing our last speaker for the day. And Clarine actually holds an ALM of 2019. Thank you for being here, Florine. Thank you so much, Saul. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, let me take some time to thank the previous presenters for the information that they've shared. There's a great advantage in being the last one. I had the opportunity to actively listen to those that went before me, um, and our work is really connected. But there's also a great disadvantage when following such a phenomenal presentation by Dan and providing another tool for student success. But kudos to everyone for tackling these necessary and very personal issues. I will use this opportunity to connect our presentations in shedding light on students who have been historically underserved, including immigrant and migrant children and those with disabilities. So it's a perfect segue into what I will be discussing this afternoon. Earlier this week, I had the pleasure of attending a webinar um, where the panel consist, consisted of President Bacal and Dean Brown Nagin as they discussed the struggles, progress, and next steps of our most recent scholarship, Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery. Academic institutions across America, including Duke, Emory, Georgetown, and of course our very own Harvard, are recognizing their direct connection to the institution of slavery. They're grappling with this history and they're trying to atone for their role and they're implementing actionable solutions to combat systemic racism. During that session, the panelists shared that individuals within our community wanted to know how they can help. What can I do? And the response was very encouraging. We're all leaders in our arenas and we must be ambassadors in tackling these difficult and necessary issues like we're doing today, no matter how uncomfortable it is. So I myself see myself as, a, as an emissary Em emissary sent on a special mission to represent the voices of not just my own children, but other members of our community in discussing race in education. And now how COVID has added yet another layer to this already fraught phenomenon. And specifically within that parameter, how we are defining these COVID gap years. Leaders in education have been discussing the COVID gap years as a time when students are experiencing some learning loss. The term learning loss is not new and it's been widely used in the world of education for several decades as a way to measure the regressions students experience during periods of time when they're not in school, such as during the summer months. Um, specifically, children are diagnosed and measured with losing a year or more of learning. Traditionally, we've measured learning loss through specific assessments and other types of tests as listed here on the slide. Whether it's a standardized test, a cognitive assessment, an achievement test, or a placement test, research has been plenty on how these formal tests are culturally biased, they're outdated and limited in how they measure learning. 
proficiency and academic success. To help remedy learning loss, a lot of educators have employed interventions such as remedial and resource classes, after school, before school, and summer school in an attempt to make up the loss. Historically, learning loss was confined to the summer months or during extended school absences. However, research shows that Black and Brown children suffer more learning loss during the school year than during summer months. This is partly due to racist policies and environments where these children experience microaggressions, high absenteeism, and lack of access to quality education. More learning loss during the school year than during summer months equates to inherently racist school experience in the US. Therefore, it is very critically important that we accurately define learning loss so that we can identify root causes of the problem and implement actionable solutions. What did we learn during COVID? Well, COVID exposed inequities within our education system, such as who has access to what they need, which we'll discuss shortly, and what type of learning do we consider important? The learning that is important is one that is measured in a very specific way through traditional testing. Second, COVID gave parents a window into the classroom environment. Children were no longer running home to tell mom and dad of incidents that occurred in school, and parents were no longer relying on their children for this information, since children may miss some of the issues that parents have more experience in recognizing. Instead, what happened was that parents now had a, a certain visibility of classroom content, quality, and access, and had the knowledge to make informed decisions about how and where their children should be educated. Parents are now electing to educate their children in academic pods, homeschool programs, and other academic settings, which allows them more control over the learning environment and experience. A national example of parents' visibility into the classroom is the lawsuit from Craig and Kelly Robinson. This is Michelle Obama's brother and sister-in-law, and they're suing the schools, the school that their sons um, once attended. The Robinsons are raising concerns about racial bias at the school and offensive classwork and assignments. These are not novel issues. These assignments and classwork were probably part of the curriculum for some time. However, parents are now charged with the new expectation of understanding these assignments so that we can help, help teach our children in the um, virtual environment. And we're seeing that curriculum content at times are blatantly racist or contain racial undertones. Lastly, what we learned from COVID is that learning loss within its traditionally constrained definition may be a faulty premise and can easily be used to target and discriminate against black and brown children. Learning loss was already occurring. It is now magnified during COVID. You may ask, well, how can they use this information to target and discriminate? The political outcry and the social outcry during COVID was children must be in a classroom building to learn. With this flawed information, many schools, especially private schools with the financial resources, did just that. Here's one case study to consider. While this is a real school, the name has been changed to protect the innocent. So at Prep Academy, where the school population is predominantly white and affluent students, it closed for about five months, but it had the access and ability to follow strict COVID protocols. So it has stayed open for the majority of the pandemic. They had thermometers installed in the ceilings of the school entrance. They had a strict week weekly testing protocol. They also had access to technology, the hardware and the software in case they needed to close. And while Prep Academy has always assessed their students, there was never a baseline score. Now COVID has provided a minimum score, which they're terming COVID learning loss as a way to target and discriminate against black and brown children. So students seeking admission are now assessed against this COVID gap year metric to be denied admission. Well, the overwhelming number of students experiencing this COVID learning loss are black and brown children, where most public schools were not able to open and those who were able to were consistently closing due to outbreaks. If we take a step back to look at this a little bit more globally, 
Learning loss is more of a subtext about how Black and Brown children learn where additional interventions are necessary to help students make up the loss. So students need more schooling, including after school, summer school, remedial classes. And these ideas are racially motivated. The theme of needing more schooling because of how Black and Brown children learn reinforces what has been occurring in the field of, ed of education since Brown versus Board of Education, where instead of defining the root cause of these issues, which is usually a racist undertone, we instead circle the wagon about the issue and deprive underserved children with access and quality. What we saw during COVID was that a number of public schools were ill-prepared for the global pandemic. Students could not get access to the hardware or software needed to attend virtual school. For example, one major public school system found that attendance rates for black and brown children were incredibly low during COVID because these students lacked access to the technology that they needed for school. The school system only provided one laptop for each household even when multiple school aged children resided in the home. And let's not forget about high speed internet. COVID unearthed this disparity in the most glaring way. I have a laptop, but I cannot connect because I lack access to Wi Fi. Most students lacking access to technology in the form of hardware and software were predominantly residing in poor neighborhoods. These communities are largely black and brown children. We also came to terms with the quality of educators and the curriculum. What does it mean to be a certified teacher? And is the curriculum meeting the educational needs of the students? So COVID did not cause learning loss, but instead it exposed the inequities within the education system. During my research, I found a gem of a school, a magnet school that has found success in providing access and quality to their students. Again, while this school actually exists, the name has been changed. The executive director of this school did two things, invested in access and quality, and it has made all the difference. So Acme Charter School has a school population of predominantly black and brown students. It closed during the pandemic. It provided students with the laptop they needed and the virtual programs for their education. They provided the household, the household with high-speed internet and they invested in quality education, the curriculum itself, and educators, the teachers. They found that their attendance rates were much higher during COVID than in previous years. They also removed all learning interventions. So no summer school, no extra testing, no remedial classes. Again, they invested in access and quality. And the result was that learning loss was non-existent. While students do experience some learning loss, the root cause of it has little to do with how students are learning, but instead stems from access and quality. And while we continue to struggle with understanding the root cause of this phenomena, finding other ways to define learning in a more comprehensive manner may prove beneficial. During COVID, students gained other skills that are just, if not more valuable than academic learning standards to be tested in a classroom. Maybe they learned how to garden, they learned how to ice skate, roller skate, they learned how to sing, they learned how to draw, or they learned how to play an instrument. They had to learn how to interact with teachers and other students in a virtual environment. They experienced developmental growth in these areas. They strengthened family relationships and connections. They learned empathy. They learned about personal loss through sickness and death. And they learned a lot about technology and how to navigate the many programs necessary for their classes. Students deserve credit for these non-academic skills. So while learning loss may be occurring, it is important that we get to its root cause. It's a lack of access and quality. We need to provide access and improve the quality of teaching. And we may also want to challenge our definition of learning by removing some of the traditional constraints of only looking at learning that occurs within a classroom because students are gaining necessary life skills for success outside of the classroom environment. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. I look forward to your questions. Clarine, this was um, so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this with us because 
you know, you don't just touch on the COVID years, on um, the, the social inequity gap and how COVID really showcased in our faces without us having to, you know, have any option to turn around something that us in tech have known for a long time uh, about how the social inequities and tech access inequities are distributed, you know, uh, around and along intra and inter um, mm -hmm. racial lines. So um, that is, is, is very poignant, um, the, the research you have done. And I actually do have a specific question and it is um, targeting specifically the last point that you brought up. Um, one of the key indicators of success in STEM, in STEM careers, engineering, any type of STEM career is actually this soft called non-cognitive skills, called life skills. And they're crucial because for example, um, creativity. Creativity is something that has to be fostered. How are you going to be that innovator that it is actually going to change the world and create some type of solution on a very specific thing if you're not creative enough to actually imagine it? Uh, mm -hmm. Creativity is a huge, powerful, that is extremely um, underplayed in many cultures, not just America. Um, you know, I, I personally do a lot of work internationally in tech education, and that is, um, you know, in the Emirates. And that is one of the things that there, you know, there is this gap because of this non-cognitive skills, right, are not really well presented and instructed how, um, you know, critical thinking. Critical thinking is vital, right? And and all of this has been really coming to the forefront in many, many countries uh, like Bahrain, for example, as to what to do with that, with the gender divide and also the racial divide, because these countries, as well as our country, we have, we do have different racial experiences, but at the end of the day, solutions are similar. So, in regards to all these divides that you express, um, how do you interface those non-cognitive skills? Because, you know, fomenting those in the in the lost COVID years, right? Or learning loss is a very powerful way to start getting forward into action, right? To mm -hmm. help you recover education. Yeah, I think you bring up some really great points there, Saul. So let me take it. Um, at, at the global level, and then I'm going to take it at, at the smaller um, level. Globally, when we think about school in America, we think about funding. It's one of the first things that always come to mind. And whenever we're cutting funding um, and we take it to the local school level, the first thing that they cut are those non-cognitive um, curricula. For example, they will cut art, they will cut music, um, and those types of non-academic um, subjects. And what STEM has done that I could really appreciate is they've had they've added an A into STEM to make it STEAM, right? So that A stands for art because they understand that that creative process is critically important to the other areas of STEM. It's really interconnected. What you find is that a lot of children who are good in, who are, who excel in the non-cognitive abilities, they will also excel academically because of what it does. It really broadens their minds and their horizons, and it teaches them how to um, interact in that academic setting. So I think it's really important that we push those non-cognitive skills, because when we do, we are inherently also pushing the academics. And I think somewhere in there, the educators have lost sight of that. So I can appreciate STEM for adding that as part of the prong um, so that educators can understand how important it is to foster 
artistic ways to foster those non-cognitive abilities. So I think that's really how we sort of marry the two and figure out how to push both forward. We cannot get rid of the academic part. That is essential and we need it. We must learn how to read, write, and do arithmetic. We all agree with that. But it should not come at sort of the, um, it shouldn't come at the, at the depth of art and creativity. Those two, two things should be married and they should be equally important. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, and it was wonderful how you expressed that too, because I, in agreement, we're in agreement. Um, uh, and actually, uh, Ariel, who is um, one of our um, board directors, um, is asking also a really great question that granularizes your research even further. His question is, was the gap more prevalent in one group than another? Um, the learning loss gap, is that what he's asking? I am pretty positive that is what he's going to. Well, absolutely, it's going to be, right? So if you have um, white affluent kids who have access and who have quality, their gap is going to be smaller and it may be non-existent. If you look at the root cause and we're talking about access and quality, schools with more resources like your private schools they're not going to experience learning loss the same way because they do have access and they do provide quality. So where you're going to see it are in schools that don't have the funding to support those two tenets of education, access and quality. So predominantly you'll find that in your poor communities. And as we know, we all live in America, a lot of our poor communities are made up of black and brown children. So that gap is going to be wider. That's not really the issue. The issue is how are we defining this and how are we tackling it so that we have a sustainable response to it? So if we already know that there is a wide learning loss, a wider gap for black and brown children, we need to increase access and quality. And that is really what's lacking. That's the biggest difference between those two groups. I love that you said a sustainable response. Um, you know, we actually, I was talking to Dean Coleman about sustainability and how it drives me, it's like ethics. Um, it, it's crazy for me to hear climate ethics or animal ethics is all ethics is either that bonds us as humanity right i mean morals are what changes in between cultural groups or subgroups ethics are right or wrong regardless of where we live and sustainability is the same a lot of sustainability has been uh, spoken of as this big green thing if, if it is good for the environment but sustainability is a crucial point for development for access and COVID has brought to the forefront the reality that changes are not meaningful mm -hmm. unless they're sustainable that's right and um actually dan bergman um talks about a very specific point and um, he says that it is slow to do, but easy to say, mm -hmm. we need to replace racism with access. And I'm sure you have um, specific talks on that, um, on, on, on that specific wording semantic in the syntaxes of how Dan displays it, because I think it's 100% it's true. Um, actually, um, at DIL, I am working with a company that is uh, providing like the old Nikola Tesla experiment where you would actually have electricity pass through the air. Electricity was free until it was institutionalized. Mm -hmm. He would turn on all these light bulbs on the side of a hill uh, from another building very far away without any cables and they will light up. Electricity mm -hmm. can be distributed through the air. So on that, uh, he's a Slovenian innovator, and um, he was, why can't we do this with Wi-Fi? And now we are actually taking Wi-Fi through air um, in Africa, uh, and we are actually developing uh, that system of Wi-Fi through air in Africa in, in, in you know, disparate 
areas of East, Central, and Western Africa, and we are providing them with cloud, uh, with the Petatera cloud. Um, so on that point, and on this specific snippet of Wi-Fi through air, right? <laughs> Free Wi-Fi, um, no cables, no need of retrofitting infrastructure. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of innovative ways to provide access if we want to. I think that's key. We have to want to do it. Um, because America was founded in racism, we are sort of, it's part of the fabric of who we are. So there are a lot of things that are not done in America, not because it's hard, but because it may allow everyone to be on an even playing field. The big topic now is DEIA, right? Diversity, equity, inclusiveness, and access. But are we really living up to that? It's sort of the sound bite of my generation, so to speak. We're pushing it. If we're talking about providing free Wi-Fi in Africa and it's readily available, is it possible? And I want you to really think about this. Is it possible for us to do the same here in America? I can answer that question. The infrastructure <laughs> and the politics, it doesn't make it possible. Yeah. We have tried. We have tried to actually tie up with Biden's infrastructure you know, bill, and it has not been able to happen. We are right now actually launching that in California in two specific cities. Mm -hmm. But it is the problem, I think, is not um, it, it happens better change occurs faster in in governments that are unitarian in governments that are not so divided the federalistic approach of our country makes change hard because it starts passing i mean we just need to see the latest um you know the supreme court uh, you know uh, sneak preview yeah. um that um passing it to you know, the idea of passing it to the states. That entire idea, that federalistic view of government makes change very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And we cannot do it in the US and the Biden administration is super keen in embracing it and there's nothing that can be done. So for example, digital transformation in public health. Um, mm -hmm. We are digitally transforming the entire public health system of the country of Bermuda. Mm -hmm. That cannot be done in the United States. Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with our history um, and what we deem to be important and the progress that we want certain groups of people to make. We, it, it works to our advantage to keep certain groups marginalized. Um, it's unfortunate. It's a difficult and uncomfortable conversation to have. And even in Harvard's you know, hundreds of years in existence, we're now starting to talk about its legacy with slavery. So it's not just a slow moving change, but it is a, a progress that is hard to even see. Um, and it's unfortunate that in America where we have access to so many things where we're considered a world power, there are things that we continue to struggle with because we are holding on to that, to that history so that it can inform what people think is part of their legacy. You're 100% correct how history has informed our uh, governmental and infrastru infrastructure dis of decision-making. Yes. So then the history then gets being reinforced in that decision-making. And we do have a question from Jill Felicio, where are there obvious differences in age groups, elementary age versus high school? I didn't really look at that. Um, I was looking at it more broadly, but let me um, respond by saying this. The two case studies that I looked at, Prep Academy is a first through 12th grade institution, whereas Acme Charter School was, um, I think they're kindergarten through fifth grade, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't know that it will make a difference. Uh, I guess my educated guess would be this. In the elementary school where you are providing that foundational learning of reading, writing, arithmetic, um, cultural awareness, non-cognitive um, skill building, it will be hard for them to make it up later in high school if you don't 
catch it at that point. I think we're all very familiar with um, the study that looked at when we start building beds for children in, in prison. We start doing it in third grade. If we realize that there is a student in third grade who is not reading up to grade level, then they're more likely going to end up either as a dropout, um, in crimes, or in jail. So because that that's a connection that we're making, it's probably very important for us to catch them at that early stage. But even at the high school level, if there are gaps there, they don't have a lot of time to make it up. High school is three or four years, and then they're sort of leashed out into the world, whether they go to college, the military, or into the workforce. So that learning loss is not, I guess, caught up and addressed um, very quickly in that time frame. then we're going to lose them. Again, I did not look at that specifically, but that's sort of my educated guess of why it's probably important to catch it at both levels, and the gap is probably the same in, in both grade um, levels. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think that you're 100% uh, uh, correct in your informed um, critical thinking way of answering Jill's question. And um, before I close, I just want to point out that our own Alan from Tech Support actually does say that and please everybody look at, pay attention at, at the very key way of how he's actually using capitalization in his comment, ethics uh, with capital CS and STEAM, he thinks is the future of computer science education. And um, I think that Clarine uh, is agreeing with me. Yes, it is not just the future, but it's the equalizer. Yes. So um, I, I just wanted to point that out. And I want to thank all the amazing speakers that we have had today. Um, I want to thank as Vice President of the HEAA Board, the amazing support that we have from our Office of Advancement. Um, it helps us coalesce as a community and we can be that arm the board can be that arm to actually bring our community together. I want to thank our Dean as well. I want to thank for this incredible topics. And um, on a personal note, if I felt uh, proud and honored to represent our community in leadership after this very specific event, I, I feel uh, even more so. And um, Dan, this is a big hug for you. Um